Uh, first off, just want to th say thanks for the opportunity to come out and visit with you all today. Um, as you see, we're going to be spending the next hour or so talking about mounted bearing installation and preventative maintenance practices. Um, let's see here. Okay. Um, just to give you an idea here on the agenda, uh, obviously you all can read that, so I won't read it verbatim, but start off talking about OSHA standards and uh, how they're related to grain handling specifically for preventative maintenance and bearings, cover a few bearing myths, and then talk about mounted bearings. Obviously, you're probably familiar with mounted bearings, but what are they? Where are they found? Types of different mounted bearings. Um, we have some examples up here. I, I won't pass these around because uh, we're a little bit spread out around the room, but ball bearings, tapered roller bearings, and spherical roller bearings. Um, and then we'll get into really the meat of the presentation. That's really the maintenance side of things and installation. You know, talk about proper alignment with regards to bearings, also torque specs and shaft tolerances, and then spend a good bit of time talking about lubrication and try to address some of the, uh, some of the questions. You know, there's a lot of times we'll have some questions regarding how much grease, how often, what type of grease, you know, the things, things that uh, you all see in your facilities. So, finish up with discussing seals, and then we'll also um, just talk a little bit about mounted bearing long-term storage, okay? So um, you see up here, I, I have some different bearing examples, and I, I went and robbed some of my kids' toys, and you're probably wondering how sports and, you know, party cups relate to mounted bearings, so we'll get into that here in just a minute. <clears throat> okay, so as far as the OSHA standards go, you know, there's nothing really specifically for bearings, um, but 1910-272, does relate to preventative maintenance. And, and really, um, I tried to highlight uh, what it talks about here, uh, lubrication and other appropriate maintenance in accordance with manufacturer's recommendations. So a lot of times, you know, people will ask, what does Dodge recommend for bearings? Or, you know, maybe different manufacturers that are out there for mounted bearings, they might ask, what do they recommend and try to adhere to those standards? And as you see, when we get into talking about, especially relubrication, what I'm gonna share with you is what I would recommend, but at the same time, don't take it as the gospel because each facility is different, each application is different. And so really, it's tough to pinpoint, you know, exactly you have to do this, you have to grease X number of times a week, X number of times a month. Um, you know, it's really tough to do that because as you all know, every application that uses bearings is going to be different in your facilities, okay? So some mounted bearing myths that are out there, this is, this is probably the most popular one and my favorite one is number one, uh, you know, if lubricant's visible easing out around the shaft in the seal area, then obviously the seal's been compromised, i.e., you blew out the seal, okay? So you're going to hear me talking a lot today about purging seals and, and purging bearings, okay? So that, that's one that we'll address. Uh, obviously, you know, bearings, they should not be hot to the touch. You know, if you have a bearing that's hot to the touch, then we have a problem. Um, you know, as far as set screws go, a lot of times with set screw mounted bearings, which is going to be the most popular bearing in, in most of your applications, the idea of, you know, going ahead and just tightening one set screw down all the way, then going and tighten the second set screw down all the way. Um, you know, we'll, we'll talk about set screws, torques, and uh, shaft tolerances, and that number four also is, is regarding shaft tolerance. You know, if a bearing, if a shaft spins inside a bearing race, um, you know, the idea of just going ahead and tightening down the set screws even more is going to take care of the problem. Sealed for life bearings, maybe you have some sealed for life or lube for life bearings in your plants. Um, you know, there's a misconception about those a lot of times too that sealed for life bearings will run for a lifetime. Okay, that's not quite the case. Um, you know, relubricating once a year, I, I don't know that anybody, maybe, maybe you do in certain applications, but for the most part, relubricating once a year is not, not really recommended. And uh, also, any grease will do. You know, there's differences in grease, not as much, uh, you know, the style or the brand, I should say, but uh, a lot of times, you know, the different bases, and we'll talk about that. And then just shooting grease through the fitting, you know, the idea of just walking up to a bearing and it's covered in uh, maybe some sort of grain dust, you know, just pumping it full of grease, uh, that's obviously no, no, we don't want to do that. And then, you know, if, bearing makes no, if a bearing makes noise, then the idea is, well, we just need to put more grease in it, okay? If a bearing's making a noise, generally speaking, at that point, it's past the point of rescue. You might be able to continue to grease it, get some more life out of it, but ultimately that bearing should be changed if you're hearing it making a growling noise already, okay? So... What are mounted bearings? This is something I'd like to just, just make sure we all understand the difference when we're talking about mounted bearings versus unmounted or naked style bearings. 
really the, the focus today will be on the mounted bearings on the left. And we really aren't going to discuss naked or unmounted bearings much. So a mounted bearing, as you can see up there, will be a self-contained unit, something out of the box that a lot of times is going to be shaft ready. You know, it's going to have some sort of housing that you'll be able to bolt down to your structure. It's going to contain seals, generally already pre-greased from the factory, and it is a relubricable type of bearing. Okay, so that's, that's what we're talking about today as, as we focus on bearing maintenance. Whereas an unmounted or a naked ball bearing is going to be something that's similar to like a motor bearing or maybe a, a bearing that incorpor is incorporated into a piece of machinery where you're not going to go through and necessarily re-lubricate that bearing. A lot of times these are the quote-unquote sealed bearings that are usually pressed into a piece of equipment that, that just rotate until they fail and then you take it out and replace it. So where are bearings found? Obviously these pictures probably look pretty familiar with a lot of your, your uh, operations. Okay, so pit conveyors, you know, tail sections, you can have pillow block bearings or possibly a, a take-up style bearing. And then up on head sections, a lot of times you'll have pillow, bear, pillow block bearings or flange style bearings. Bucket elevators, good example, obviously big, big bearings when you get up into a lot of the top of bucket elevators. <clears throat> so just some exposed bearings there, easier to see. So reclaim conveyors, again, you know, down underneath. A lot of times uh, pillow blocks or maybe a wide slot take-up style bearing on a take-up frame. Two-bolt flange bearing there. And then on, on drag or chain style conveyors, you know, a lot of the incline uh, conveyors are going to use a pillow block style or you might have a flange, uh, flange block style here as well. Okay. And then also belt conveyors, you know, um, opener and closed belt conveyors. That's maybe a little tough to see, but you're going to have your gearbox or your drive here, and then you'll have your bearing sandwiched uh, up against the, um, the housing structure. Okay. So that's a little bit about where we're going to find bearings. Obviously, a lot of this stuff is you know, redundant. You've, you've seen the applications where mounted bearings are, are located. Okay. But what I'd like to do is spend a little time here talking about different bearing characteristics. And as I mentioned, we'll be focusing on ball bearings, tapered roller bearings and spherical roller bearings and the differences between them, you know, why you would use one versus the other. So the first bearing we'll discuss are ball bearings. And, and ball bearings are going to be probably the most common throughout your facility uh, for a number of reasons. They're a pretty versatile bearing. Um, they're also going to be your least expensive mounted bearing option. So the, the people cutting the checks or that have to buy the replacement parts like this idea because they're going to be the most inexpensive option. But as I mentioned, they're pretty versatile in the sense that they can handle light to, to medium loads. Um, generally speaking, zero RPM to, you know, four, five, six thousand RPM as far as speed ranges go, depending on, on the application. And they can handle pure radial, pure thrust, or combination loads. Any, anybody know the difference when we talk radial and thrust loads? What are we talking about? Because that's going to come up a little bit here. Ra what's a radial load or an example of a radial load on a bearing? Any application? It's going to be a load that's being applied perpendicular to the shaft, okay, or being applied against it. So a perfect example of a radial load would be something like a belt conveyor, a bucket elevator, uh, you know, a chain or a drag style conveyor because the load is constantly being pulled down on the bearings, okay, whereas a thrust load is something where the load is trying to drive more through the bearing, uh, bearing bore. So what would be an example of a load that's trying to th drive through the bearing bore? I'm trying to go this way, okay an auger, screw conveyor, okay? And I know those are going to be throughout your facilities as well. So um, just want to clear that up as far as what a radial load and a thrust load is. A, a, a radial load is being applied down on the bearing, and a thrust load will be applied, will be applied through the bearing. Also with ball bearings, there's really no minimum load requirements. So these, these can run with like zero weight on the application, or they can typically run, again, each bearing depends on uh, the, overall, uh, the overall size of the bearing as, as how much load they can handle. But you know, most of the time, ball bearings are probably going to be max of uh, somewhere in about the two to 3,000 pounds, but that's generally if you have a bigger shaft, maybe like in the 2 and 15, 3 and 7, 16 style range, okay? So I brought these sports balls here uh, to try to give you an idea, too. When we talk about ball bearings, um, we're talking about point contact. So really what we mean is 
if you look at the raceways on a ball bearing, it looks like it's really making contact all the way around that rolling ball. But in reality, it's just really making contact on one small spot right on the bottom of the ball and right on the top of the ball. Okay? So because of that, it allows the ball to roll real free and real smooth, and there's not a lot of metal-to-metal -metal opportunity. So that's why they can handle very high speeds. All right? But at the same time, on the flip side, they don't like to handle really heavy loads when you have all that load being applied right on that small spot. Okay? Now, this is just a cutaway of a standard uh, set screw style ball bearing. So, but most any manufacturer's bearing is going to share all these common features of, you know, an inner ring, an outer ring, some sort of cage or retainer. You know, the seal configuration is going to look different between manufacturers, but that's just a common cutaway of ball bearings. So ball bearings are high speed, light load, generally speaking. On the complete opposite end of the spectrum are, are tapered roller bearings. Now, tapered roller bearings, like ball bearings, can also share uh, the common characteristics of radial load capability and thrust load capability or combination loads. Okay? They're, they're well suited to handle heavy radial loads, heavy thrust loads, or combination loads, but unlike ball bearings, they don't typically like high-speed applications. It's not going to be common that you're going to find tapered roller bearings on fans or hammer mills or things like that. Okay? The reason that they don't is because, as we talked about with point contact with ball bearings, the taper roller bearing is more like a drinking glass that's laid on its side, okay? So there's full surface contact between the raceways and the rolling elements. And because of that, again, they can handle a lot of loads because you have a wide range for the load to be dispersed, but they don't like high speeds because you have a lot of opportunity for metal-to-metal -metal contact, all right? Now, one thing I put in here is that these are great for augers and screw conveyors. You know, generally speaking, if your auger doesn't have a ball bearing on it, it should have a tapered roller bearing on it. You don't want to get into auger applications that you have spherical roller bearings, and we'll talk about those on the next slide here, or the next couple slides. But these are really the bearing for screw conveyors. You know, the common, you might hear the industry standard, the Type E, okay, the Dodge Type E. That's a four bolt flange a lot of times, and it's going to be a double row tapered roller bearing. So this this, again, is construction here for um, this style of bearing. This is a pillar block. It's called a type, type EXL. But basically, this particular one, you have double set screw collar shaft attachments, your double row tapered rollers, and the inner race is commonly called the cone assembly when you talk about tapered rollers, and the outer race is going to be called the cup assembly or the cup. So, but these are well suited to handle, again, pure radial load, pure thrust load. So belt conveyors, screw conveyors, I mean, really any conveyor in your facility. You just don't want to have these on fans and high-speed applications like uh, any hammer mills or if you have centrifuges, things like that. This wouldn't be probably the bearing you want to have in those applications. So high loads, lower speeds. Now spherical bearings, they're really the best of both worlds. I, I like spherical bearings. You know, you might hear names like, uh, you know, the, the S2000 bearing or the Dodge Imperial bearing. Um, you know, those are all going to be spherical style bearings. What's nice about spherical bearings is they're very forgiving. They offer a lot of misalignment capability. Um, and they also can offer um, what other, generally speaking, ball bearings and taper bearings don't offer is expansion capability as much. You know when we talk about uh, what we're talking about when we say expansion? Why would you want a bearing that has expansion? Talking about the axial float where the bearing can move back and forth in the bearing housing. Why would you want something like that? Thermal shaft expansion, okay? Heat. So as metal heats up, the, the shaft is going to expand. And if you have two fixed bearings on a shaft, generally speaking, the bearings are going to start to get preloaded as the shaft heats up. So if you have an expansion bearing, that way it can float back and forth a little bit as that shaft heats up and cools down, all right? So spherical roller bearings are well suited to handle expansion. Um, and we have this curved contact. You know, we talked about the point contact with the ball, and then we had that taper, or the taper roller had full surface contact. With a spherical bearing, you have curved contact. So basically, like a football, you know, it's just gonna, ru it's gonna ride right on the, the curved part of the ball. So it's almost like a barrel laid on its side. So these bearings are well suited to handle misalignment. Like I said, they're well, they're well suited to handle speed ranges. Okay, generally speaking, they can handle higher speeds than tapered bearings, but not quite as high as ball bearings. And they can handle higher loads than ball bearings, um, but a lot of times not quite as high loads as tapered bearings, depending on the application. All right. 
Now, one thing I would point out though, is this, as I mentioned earlier, this is not the bearing that you want on your screw conveyor auger applications. And the tendency, and the reason is, is because um, these bearings require basically one pound of radial load for each pound of thrust load. So if you have an application that, like an auger or screw conveyor, that's almost a pure thrust load application, what happens with this style of bearing is the tendency is that the rollers, instead of rolling as the shaft rotates, they just kind of skid along if they don't have a good radial load applied to them. So if they're skidding along, eventually that curved roller um, is going to start to develop flat spots and basically turn into a rectangle. Once it does that, bearing, the roller is going to turn sideways and lock up the bearing. All right. The other thing with spherical rollers is if they have a heavy, heavy thrust load, they'll also want to try to push themselves out of the raceway. Um, I have a couple cutaways here, so like I said, they're a little heavy and tough to pass around and spread out room, but afterwards, if you want to come up and take a look at the differences between them, um, you can see how those rollers could have a tendency to push themselves out of the raceway. <clears throat> Any questions about the bearings that we, that we covered, ball, taper, spherical? Um, so this is a, a cutaway of a Dodge Imperial bearing, a double row spherical roller. Um, this, this ring here, it looks a little purple in color, actually. Um, that's an, a snap ring to where you can actually make this bearing expansion or non-expansion by moving it over one groove. And a lot of manufacturers have something similar to that. It might have what they call a stabilizer ring, you know, where you can pull off a cap and pull out a ring, if you're familiar with that style of bearing too. That, that's the same concept. This is just in a one-piece housing to where you can use a snap ring and move it one groove or the other. But, you know, seals, um, you know, in this, this case here, triple lip seal, you got your double row rollers. This is an adapter sleeve mount. It could be set screw style mount. Um, and then you obviously the inner race and the outer race. All right, so that's, that's really the difference between the, the three bearing styles um, that we'll be focused on today when we talk about maintenance. So I was mentioning about misalignment capabilities with bearings, and there, there's two kinds of misalignment. You have static misalignment conditions and dynamic misalignment conditions. So in a static misalignment condition, basically, what we're talking about are you have two bearings that are on uneven planes, all right? Dynamic misalignment's a little different animal, but if you have misalignment in your application, obviously you don't want to have any misalignment, but things like bent screws, um, you know, maybe heavy loads on a bucket elevator, uh, maybe a guy with a forklift or some sort of equipment came by and nailed the tail end of a conveyor and now it's all out of whack, okay? That's, that's where you're gonna get misalignment, but if you do have misalignment in your applications, a lot of times, um, that can lead to high, high bearing temperatures, especially if you have high speed, like in fans or any high speed applications, um, you know, it can enhance vibration even worse. So, you know, ideally we don't want to have any misalignment, but the fact of the matter is, is a lot of these applications in your facilities, it's, it's just very difficult to get away from misalignment, okay? So, as I mentioned, you have two kinds. You have static misalignment conditions and dynamic misalignment conditions. So, as I mentioned, static are going to be, you know, un uneven planes. Okay, or it could be a, like the third picture in there, it could be a situation like a bucket elevator where you have such a heavy load that the shaft is actually deflecting and those bearings are gonna be uh, riding like this all the time inside the housing. Now, the one on the far right, if you had to have any, any misalignment in your application, you wanna have static, because the one on the far right is a, is a violent misalignment condition, that's dynamic misalignment. So that's gonna be like if you have oscillating loads, any sort of shaker screens or bent shafts, where every time the shaft is rotating, the bearings are doing this in the housing, okay? Ball bearings and tapered roller bearings are not gonna last in those applications. You really need to have a spherical style bearing in those applications um, in order to handle dynamic misalignment. But again, you, you know, again, if it's a shaker screen or, or some sort of uh, application where you just have an oscillating load, it's, it's inevitable you're gonna have this, but if it's something where you have a bent shaft, obviously the recommendation is, you know, at a shutdown to replace that bent shaft. Um, otherwise, you're gonna be replacing bearings a lot more frequently, okay? But, you know, bearings, um, when we talk about ball bearings especially, you know, they can, all ball, all ball bearings really, mounted ball bearings are designed from this line, okay? So they can pivot back and forth in the housing just they have a spherical OD, and that's really how they're manufactured, too, is you turn it into housing that way, okay? And then a lot of times, too, like split cap bearings will have some misalignment capability. Now, people will ask, well, how much can I misalign a bearing? You know, can I, can I make it go like 10 degrees? And the answer to that is no, you really can't. But 
Ball bearings, generally speaking, have about a one and a half degree max misalignment capability. And the reason for that is because this, um, this grease groove here lines up with the zerk, okay? If you get more than about one and a half degrees out of whack on your alignment, then what happens is the grease groove no longer lines up with the zerk. And so as you pump grease in here, it's actually not going to make it into the bearing. All right, spherical bearings, um, Imperial S2000 style bearings, is the same thing. It's about a degree, degree and a half of misalignment that you can, that you can uh, move those um, and still get grease to go into the bearing and, and have the rollers um, not get popped out of the raceway. But tapered bearings are actually a bit more forgiving. If you get into split cap, you know, two-piece housing tapered bearings, you might get four up to eight degrees of misalignment capability. So depending on the application, maybe if you have a lot of misalignment, you know, the tapered bearing might be the way to go if it's, if it's uh, something that you can't correct in the application. So as we're talking about uh, misalignments and shafts and things like that as well, I want to focus on shaft tolerance for a minute. Okay, the next two slides between shaft tolerance and torque, uh, torque specs are probably two of the most overlooked things when we talk about mounted bearings. Obviously the bearing, you grease the bearing and the bearing fails and you replace the bearing. And you probably don't think about the shaft that often. How many, by a show of hands, how many people get out their micrometers or their calipers and, and mic a shaft every time you replace a bearing? How many, how many get your calipers out and check the shaft? Okay. I'm here as a manufacturer uh, representative to tell you, you know, that's what you should do, but I also understand real world and also understand on the job. And that's not going to happen. I realize it. Okay. <laughs> but what I'm here to tell you is, you know, if you do have those culprits where, especially with set screw bearings, if you're having a set screw bearing that keeps coming loose on the shaft, it's probably not the bearing itself that's causing a problem. That's where you want to, that, that is where you want to get out the micrometer, get out the caliper, and check and see that your shaft's within a good tolerance. Now, when we talk about tolerances uh, regarding shafting, you know, believe it or not, set screw style bearings actually have the tightest uh, required tolerance in order for them to properly function. Okay, you think, well, an adapter mount bearing, you know, it, it's probably going to have a really tight tolerance. They all do, but you can see here that adapter mount bearings, sleeve style bearings, um, they have anywhere from three to four times uh, the little uh, wiggle room uh, versus like a set screw style bearing. So a lot of times, you know, I, I mentioned about the bearing mitts, if the shaft, you know, spins inside a bearing board, it's tightening down the set screws more, okay? You really need to look at replacing that shaft if it's far out of tolerance. And that's what I'm saying. If you're having one that keeps coming loose on the shaft, maybe check that one. Again, I understand real world, you're not going to check every single shaft when you replace bearings. But if you have repeated failures and the same offenders, that's when you probably should check that shaft to make sure it's in good shape. Okay. And as I mentioned, you know, adapter uh, sleeve style mounted bearings, they, they're a lot more forgiving. You know, you can usually use commercial shaft tolerance. You don't need to have any sort of special finishes on your shaft, and you'll be able to get away with it just fine. So, um, again, I, I realize you don't mic your shafts. So how many of you all uh, torque your set screws down with your torque wrench? You get out the torque wrench and torque set screws down when you mount the bearings. Okay, show of hands. That's, that's what I expected, so. Uh, I've done a presentation like this uh, a few times before, and I, I've never had anybody say that they get out the torque wrench to torque down set screws on a bearing, okay? And I'm here today to tell you I understand and I know you're not going to do it. And, and as much as I would like to see that happen, again, real world, I know at your facility it's not going to happen. But what I do want to tell you is, again, those ones that keep coming loose, or if you have repeated failures with set screw bearings coming loose, maybe it might be worthwhile to check it and see just how you're doing, all right? Now, I'm not telling you to get the impact gun out and go and zap down the set screws, but what I will tell you is, um, you know, that, that's usually a result of over-tightened set screws and undersized shafting, if you've ever seen a bearing where it breaks away right at the set screws. But what I'm, what I'm here to tell you is that the fasteners on your set screws or your bolts, okay, they, they have a spec on torque. And that's nothing specific to Dodge, okay, or to Rexnord or SKF or whoever the manufacturer is of your bearings. That's really based on that fastener size. It's really an industry standard, okay? So what I would, again, what I would tell you is if you have repeated failures, that's when you really should maybe take into consideration, hey, we should check our torque on our set screws. So let me show you something real quick here, a little animation um, I put together regarding set screw bearings and, and uh, <clears throat> proper torque. So we got a brand new bearing, brand new shaft. It's within that half thousandths tolerance range, like I mentioned on shaft tolerance. So everything looks good, okay? Now, 
when you go to tighten down set screws, right away, you're going to push that shaft off center because of that, that again, that little clearance, you're going to push the shaft off center. So the first, the first thing that set screw bearing, there's two things that set screw bearings do, okay? The first thing, when you tighten down the set screws, they're obviously going to push it off center and they're going to, they're going to mechanically bite the shaft. Okay, you've all seen that before where, you know, you get those set screw marks where it just di uh, digs into the shaft. That's the first thing they're going to do, but as you tighten set screws more and more, you have this perfectly circular ball pattern that these rollers are riding on. And as you tighten down those set screws more and more, what starts to happen is it, when you run them down tight, it actually starts to stretch that inner race. Because the inner race, a lot of times, is what's threaded on the bearing. So it's going to start pulling it in different directions. So now, instead of a perfectly circular pattern, now that roller kind of has to chatter around on an eccentric pattern, okay, eccentric raceway. What happens is if you over torque set screws and combined with undersized shafting and you have to tighten those set screws down even more, you're just further stretching that raceway out. Okay, so what can happen, especially if you get into high speed applications and you got that really wild pattern that the roller's riding on, you're going to get this action, the vibration's going to start, and then the set screws are going to start doing this and backing out. All right, so again, Check your torque specs, check your shaft tolerance. It's not going to be every time, but if you do have an habitual offender and you have the same application that keeps doing it, that might be worthwhile to go in and check it. All right. Other things I've seen customers do, um, you know, uh, Loctite. Obviously, you probably want to use a medium Loctite so you can get it back apart, but a lot of times Loctite on set screws people do. Um, uh, sometimes if you have the space, you can run a second set screw down almost as like a jam to hold that first one in place. Or sometimes you dimple the shaft, you know, drill a little spot in the shaft where the set screw goes. Um, I actually saw one customer that welded the, the bearing to the shaft because they were having enough trouble with it. Um, I don't recommend doing that. that. That presents a whole lot of other problems when you do that. But I think they were in dire need and the shaft was already shot anyway. So I guess I couldn't fault them there. But uh, just be cautious, what I'm telling you here, just be cautious of your torque specs on your set screws, especially if you're having any issues or you're cracking in erases and, you know, over-torquing set screws. You know, the good, the good uh, you know, rule of thumb, everybody loves rule of thumbs, but, you know, if you use a standard L-shaped Allen wrench, you know, sometimes I hear people will snug it and then back it off, quarter turn, and then snug it again, okay? What I like to say is if you have a, just a standard Allen wrench and you snug it up, and then you can flex that Allen wrench to where it's about a half off, or excuse me, about a half inch off of being straight, you know, where it's flexed about a half inch. Generally speaking, that's gonna end up somewhere in that torque range, okay? You know, T-handled Allen wrenches, if you use T-handled Allen wrenches, be a little cautious with those two because you can get cranking on those and it's pretty easy to over tighten set screws as well with that style of wrench, all right? <clears throat> okay. Anti-seize. This is another one I know that there's probably used, it's used quite a bit. All right. Who, who uses anti-seize on their bearings? Okay. Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't, I don't blame you one bit. Okay. I, I don't know how well you can see it, but a lot of times um, you get that rusty looking spot there. You know, your shaft is perfectly clean. You get that rusty looking spot on the shaft. And so you put the anti-seize right where the bearing is going to sit to try to prevent this. Okay. That's, uh, anybody know what that is? It's actually not rust. Anybody know what it is? Ever heard of fretting corrosion? Okay. This is, this is fretting corrosion, and the way fretting corrosion develops is if you have, you know, two, close, two metal surfaces that run in close contact with one another but don't touch. Set screw bearings are a perfect example of that. Because a lot of times on this, you'll see where the set screws mount, the side that the set screws mount, you'll see that really bad fretting corrosion, but maybe on the underside where there wasn't set screw, it actually it doesn't look as bad. You know, if you roll the shaft, it may, might be a little shiny there, and that's because... The, the inner race of that bearing and the shaft were actually making contact. So you didn't have that chatter going on developing this fretting corrosion. Um, you can slather on as much anti-seize as you want, but you're probably always going to still have this issue of fretting corrosion. Anybody ever tried to get, uh, you know, a C-face motor and gearbox apart or direct drive? A lot of times people call them. If it doesn't have a, like a Lovejoy or Jaw style coupling between them, you know, like a, like a right angle worm gear that's common on grain gates, motor fails, so you go to change it out and you can't get the motor off the gearbox. That's the exact same thing that's going on between that motor shaft and the input quill on that reducer is this fretting corrosion. It basically locks the two together and good luck getting them apart. All right. Really, the only way to address fretting corrosion is to, to go to an adapter sleeve style bearing. Because once you go to an adapter sleeve bearing, you get, 
Short of the little split in the sleeve, you're going to get essentially 360, day, or 360 degree clamping around that shaft, and you're not going to have any clearance between that inner race of the bearing and that, uh, and that shaft itself. So if you've ever had an adapter mount bearing, uh, again, like a, like a Dodge Imperial style bearing, and you had to take it off, a lot of times you can loosen the lock nut and get that thing back off. Okay, and that's not all the time. I realize you're going to have to cut some of them off, but that's the whole point of it is that it doesn't allow fretting corrosion to, to develop. So what I'm telling you, though, is do not use anti-seize on that style of bearing. You can use anti-seize on set screw bearings all day if you want. But with, with sleeve style bearings, like the Imperial, the Dodge Grip Tight, um, or like, a, you know, the SKF split cap style, the spherical rollers, be careful about using anti-seize, because anti-seize is basically like a grease thickener that has small solid particles that don't allow the two metal surfaces to make contact with one another. And so what can happen over the course of time through hot and cold cycles, that anti-seize starts to leach out and then you leave that tolerance, you leave that little bit of clearance between the sleeve and the shaft and that's when you start getting the shaft spinning inside the sleeve or it starts slipping going back and forth down the bearing. Um, so be careful about that if you're using anti-seize. That's really what I want you to take away from it. All right. Not saying don't use it ever again, just saying be cautious, especially if you're using that sleeve style bearing. Okay, so let's get into the meat of the presentation and that's really talking about grease lubrication. How much, how often, what kinds of grease. Um, you know, 90%, we say 90% is probably more like 98, 99% or more um, of the bearings in your applications at your facilities nowadays are gonna be grease lubricated. A lot of times, oil lubricated or oil bath bearings are going to be reserved for high speed like the centrifuges, um, sometimes hammer mills, sometimes fan applications, but your everyday conveyors will, for the most part, always be grease lubricated. <clears throat> now there's a lot of advantages to grease lubrication. Obviously it's a simple design, you know, somebody that's the first day on the job, you tell them, hey, we need these bearings to be re-lubricated. Go look for that little thing sticking off the top and put the grease gun on it, right? Okay, simple design. but. Also, besides being a simple design, the grease acts as a seal in itself, all right? So, you, you know, I, I mentioned earlier about purging or the idea of blowing the seal out and when you see grease coming out, okay? That's good. And you might say, the other bearing guy told me it wasn't. Well, you know, that's good. We want to see that with mounted bearings. A grease purge is a good thing to see. Um, also, grease provides long service life. You know, oil, a lot of times you have to have uh, maybe some elaborate filtration systems or have to change the oil out frequently with grease. You know, you might be able to grease that bearing and walk away for four, six, eight, ten months, whatever it may be, and come back to it and hit it up, uh, you know, with some pumps later on. But it, it gives a long service life and obviously simple lubricating equipment. You know, you can get grease guns pretty much anywhere you go nowadays that sell any automotive equipment. Um, so pretty simple stuff. You can get elaborate greasing systems as well. Anybody use auto lubers, like the auto lubrication greasers that may be battery powered? Okay, those, those things are slick. I mean, I like those. Um, you know, if you can dial those in, that's a really nice way, especially, you know, you never want to be that guy that has to go to the very top of the grain elevator in February or in the Midwest to, you know, to change out a bearing. Um, so, or to grease a bearing at that. So if you can get an auto luber and set it and dial it in, put it up way up top, a couple hundred feet in the air, I think that's great. All right, but um, you know, with grease, with grease bearings, uh, there, there's things that affect how long and how often we should grease. Obviously, speed, temperature, loads, those kind of things will affect uh, relubrication intervals. You know, I mentioned earlier too about grease for life bearings. The concept of a grease for life, you guys familiar with grease for life bearings? Okay, or no lube bearings? The idea of grease for life bearing is really something where, you know, the only difference I can tell you from us as a manufacturer, if, if you order a Dodge bearing that's a grease for life bearing, it's going to be the same thing as a regreasable bearing, except it's going to come with a set screw plug in the grease circ hole instead of a grease circ. So really, you could take it out and put a grease circ in and make it a greasable bearing. But the idea is that you're going to use those bearings in applications where you're just, you just don't need to go touch it very often. Okay? You know, I mentioned a grain gate earlier. You know, you got something where it's just going to go like this. Okay? you really don't need to regrease that bearing. That'd be a perfect example of a sealed for life bearing or a no lube bearing to where you put it in and you go. And then 15 years down the road, maybe the elements of you know, rain and humidity, moisture have caused it to rust and now it doesn't turn anymore. You go and take it out and put a new one in. But generally speaking, they're gonna be smaller, low cost, light duty ball bearings um, where you'd find a no lube or a grease for life style bearing. <clears throat> so, most manufacturers will have something like this in their instruction manual, and this is a relubrication interval chart. Now again, don't take this as the gospel. 
because you're probably saying, yeah, it's not going to fly. All right. If you look at these numbers on here, what it all means is uh, most, again, most of your applications are probably going to be in the first column on RPM. That's 250 RPM or less. Uh, obviously, you can see the shaft size might be tough to read going down, but the first one there says 1 and 7 16 shaft. And that first column, 250 RPMs or less. What this is telling us is that we regrease that bearing once every four months. Okay? And you're probably saying, yeah, it's not going to work for us. And you being the bearing guy, you're just trying to get more sales out of the deal if we're going to wait every four months, right? Well, the fact of the matter is, is this is based on 12 hours per day. So if you have, a, you know, a lot of facilities nowadays are pushing 24 hours a day, okay, some applications. So right out of the gate, you're going to cut all those numbers in half. So we're going to go down to two months instead of four months. But this chart really is in a pharmaceutical grade, you know, no humidity, no moisture, no contamination environment. You know, I've been to a lot of grain processing and handling facilities, and I know they're clean places, but I'm, I can't say that they're going to be as clean as a pharmaceutical grade, you know, environment. So that's where the, the temperatures, the speeds, you know, the contamination factors start to play into how much or how often should we regrease bearings. And if I had the answer to tell you that every bearing in your plant you should regrease X number of months or weeks or days or years, okay, I would, I would be like the world's bearing expert. All right, but the fact of the matter is there's a lot of variables that can go into regreasing bearings. So let's go through and talk about some of the, the differences or the different things that we can, we can do when we're, when we're relubricating re bearings. <clears throat> that chart I just showed you is a good general guideline to use um, when we talk regreasing bearings. So again, refer to the instruction manual that your manufacturer of the bearing uh, provides you and, and take a look and see what they say there, okay? But what I would also say, too, is when you go to re-grease, you know, we mentioned earlier about just putting the grease gun on the Zerk. Make sure the grease gun's clean. Make sure that Zerk is clean. It doesn't take much to go in and wipe it off and then put the grease gun on, okay? Because if you're pumping, you know, grease through a dirty grease gun or grease, dirty grease Zerk, you're just putting contamination right into that bearing, all right? Now, you know, we said four months on that chart. So let's, let's say we actually did that and we went four months. And at four months you go to relubricate the bearing. What, what I want to see as manufacturers, I want to see that grease purging and developing at that seal lip area, all right? So we don't want to see it just spewing out, but I do want to see a bead of grease, a bead of fresh grease coming at that area. And once you see fresh grease developing at that seal area, that's when you can go ahead and stop greasing, all right? Now, the other thing I would add to that is it's ideal to do it while the application is running, if it's safe to do so. Obviously, safety first, but anytime you're regreasing bearings, it's always ideal to do it when things are rotating. That way, the grease gets evenly distributed, and you're pushing, you know, you're purging contamination out at an even rate. Okay. Otherwise, if it's something where you absolutely have to have the equipment shut down, you're going to load up one spot of that bearing, and generally speaking, you're probably going to see a, a temperature spike on startup. And then eventually that grease will get distributed and start to purge out any excess grease. But it's always ideal to try to relubricate when running. Okay. Now I highlighted this because everybody loves simple rules of thumbs that you can remember. All right. This is a good rule of thumb when we're talking about purging or when we're talking about regreasing mounted bearings, and that is three shots of grease per inch of shaft size. That's going to give you about what you need. All right. So, you know, if we talk about an inch and fifteen sixteenths bearing. Uh, we'll round that up and say two inches. So roughly speaking, that bearing should see about six pumps of grease from a standard grease gun when you relubricate. Now, when I say that it needs to see six pumps of grease, what we're trying to strive for is at that four-month interval that we talked about, and I tell you to go pump six pumps of grease, we really want to see that fresh bead of grease developing you know, on pump five and then pump six, we have that fresh grease on the outside of the seal area, okay? That's when we know we've really hit it spot on with where you need to be. But if you go four months and you pump in eight pumps and you're not seeing anything, and then on pump nine or pump 10, you're seeing this black, gritty, contaminated grease coming out, and I told you to pump six pumps, what I would tell you is we've gone too far, too long on that relubrication interval. Instead of four months, we probably need to look at that two-month interval and see if we can, you know, get that fresh grease purge at six pumps at two months. That's when we know that we've really hit a spot on, all right? On the flip side, uh, what I would also tell you is, um, you know, if you wait the four months and you go to pump six pumps and on pump three, you're seeing fresh grease coming out, 
You can extend that interval out to probably six months. All right? And that's the part that's hard is I can't really give you that exact answer. But what I can tell you, <coughs> excuse me, what I can tell you is that you always want to strive to see that fresh, clean grease purging at that seal area. <coughs> Now, something to add to that, and the other thing I would tell you too, <clears throat> if you're not having a lot of bearing failures, <coughs> excuse me, if you're not having a lot of bearing failures in your, app, in your applications at your facility, you know, don't fix what isn't broke, all right? Here, I'm just here to tell you, you know, some good tricks of the trade when it comes to relubricating bearings, but by all means, if you've got something that works for you all, don't change it, all right? Now, another thing I like to add to re-greasing bearings is the, the idea that less grease more often is better than more grease less often. So on those six pumps, if, if I'm here telling you six pumps every four months and you're saying, eh, I, I don't know if we're comfortable doing that, you know, maybe go in there and hit it with two pumps a month or maybe three pumps every two months and do that. Instead of running the gas tank empty every time, you know, go half full and then reload it, half full and then reload it, okay? You know, with, with that, you're always putting a little bit of fresh grease in that bearing, and that's generally going to improve your bearing uh, life overall. If you put fresh grease in it less or more often as opposed to waiting a long period of time before you put fresh grease in all right. <clears throat> now, again, I'm speaking from a Dodge standpoint here, but with regards to Dodge bearings, Dodge roller bearings are going to use uh, a mobile grease XHP 222. It's a dark blue color. And then Dodge ball bearings are going to use a, a mobile Unirex, which is a green color. Anybody have any food grade applications in their facilities where you have to use a food grade oil or food grade uh, grease? Okay. A lot of times food grade greases are an off-white color and they're aluminum complex style greases. Um, that's what we use as a mobile FM222 aluminum complex. So you might say, yeah, we don't use mobile. We use uh, you know, Petro Canada. We might use Lubriplate or uh, the Napa down the street gives us good grease, whatever it may be. Okay? What I would tell you is I'm not as concerned with the brand. All right, this is what we put in ours, and you know, it's not going to void the warranty if you don't put the factory grease in or anything like that. But what I would tell you to be cautious of is don't mix the bases of grease. You can see here that we use a, uh, these are all lithium complex greases, okay? That's what we use on the top two, and then again, this is an aluminum complex grease here uh, with the food grade. So when I talk bases, um, you'll see different things out there. You know, polyurea is a common grease, you know, in motor bearings. Um, you know, you have clay-based greases, um, but, but again, the lithium complex and lithium greases are really what we use for our style of bearing, so obviously they're compatible with one another, but, you know, even if you put a lithium complex grease in an aluminum uh, complex food grade bearing, or vice versa, they still work okay together. What we don't want to see are these red ones where they're just not compatible at all, all right? Grease, when we talk about grease, it's made up of three things. Generally an additive, you know, if it's like an EP additive grease or a corrosion inhibitor, and then you have the majority of your, your grease uh, composition is actual oil. Anybody ever seen it to where you have, you take a brand new bearing out of the box and there's like oil sitting in the bottom of the housing or in the bottom of the box, all right? Basically what that is is the lubricant, you know, this base oil has started to separate from the thickener, and the thickener is that, that soap type material, or that, that heavy tacky stuff, that's a thickener. So that's what grease is compiled of, is, is really three things. All right, so if you see the oil kind of sitting in the bottom of the housing, don't think, man, this, this grease is bad. That's just the nature of the beast that the oil and the thickeners will separate over time. But what we don't want to do is we don't want to mix those thickener bases. That's if you get like lithium and a clay and they hit each other and you mix them together, what happens is that thickener hardens and all the oil that provides the lubricating properties will start to leach out. And so all you're left with is this hard lubricant that's not doing anything for your bearing. That's when you're going to have bearing troubles. All right. So again, not concerned with the base as much as I am, or not concerned with the brand as much as I am the base of your oil. So, you know, I mentioned, you probably heard the, the word purge or purging here a few times already. But, you know, again, I can't stress enough, you want to purge the old stuff out. You know, the idea of pumping grease into the bearing and going ahead and getting it to push underneath that seal lip and, you know, the brown dots indicate the contamination. What's eventually going to happen is that fresh grease is going to push that old stuff out. All right. Um, also, it's going to provide a good fresh grease dam here. And, and again, that, that bead of grease actually provides a good seal as well as the rubber contact seals that are, that are on the bearing as well. So, <clears throat> so here's um, some pictures that, uh, that it took. So, you know, you can see here, good grease barrier. 
It's still red in color, so a good fresh grease berry that's developed at the seal area. All right, that's good. This one, on the other hand, probably tough to see, but there is no grease present whatsoever. I'm starting to question how often that bearing gets relubricated if you don't see any grease whatsoever. I always say, you know, when I walk into a facility, I can tell good maintenance practice because you look up and you see bearings. You don't want to see them covered in grease to where you can't even see the bearing. But when you see a lot of, you know, grease that's right on the edge there, that tells me that those bearings have been well maintained. Okay, this is the scary thing is when you might have to clean it up because maybe, maybe some of these come into the plant and you may have to make it all look nice and shiny. Okay, but when you have a bearing that's clean, that's a, that's a, that's a red flag. Um, this is pretty tough to see, but basically what we're going for here is this bearing um, was relubricated where it had to be shut down. And so you have this huge glob of grease that comes out from right at one area of the seal. And that's very common that when you have an application that you have to shut down uh, or high speed applications and you go relubricate when it's shut down, you're going to get a temperature spike. All right. Um, you know, I, I, I use the analogy as when you're a kid and you're running through ankle deep water, you know, you can move pretty quick. All right. But then you maybe get into like a lake or a pond or something. You're trying to run and you got the weight, your waist deep water and you get that resistance and you feel your body heating up and exerting more energy. It's no difference. It's no different with rollers inside of a, a mounted bearing. You know, if there's more grease, that's just more that those rollers have to push through. I mean, you could probably even see an amp, you know, a little bit of an amp bump uh, on the motor when you're relubricating bearings simply because there's more grease that those rollers have to make their way through. And eventually, the excess grease is going to push itself out. You know, um, go back a couple slides here. So I showed that big blue arrow right at the seal lip area. You know, when you pump grease into the bearing, that seal is going to want to lift off. Temperatures are going to go up, and that excess grease is going to purge out, and eventually that seal is going to come back down on the area where it needs to be. But you know, in the interim, you will see that little bit of a temperature spike. And don't panic. A lot of people think, oh, it's getting hot. I need to cool it down with more grease. Okay, as I just mentioned, all you're going to do is increase the temperature even more if you keep pumping grease into it. You know, with fan bearings especially or hammer mills, those ones you have to baby because generally speaking, they're bigger shafts. So I'm telling you put more grease in it because it's a bigger shaft bearing. All right, but again, that whole less grease more often is better than more grease less often. Can't ring more true with high speed applications. All right. That's when you're, start, you're going to start getting really high temperature spikes quick on even two, three, four pumps. And I'm telling you, put 15 in a, you know, 4 and 15 bearing, um, you're thinking, man, I can't even get to 15. I can't even get to 4 without the temperature going through the roof. Okay? So that's where you're going to want to put you know, less grease more often as opposed to going and waiting and putting all 15 pumps in at one time. All right. Um, here's a little video. Um, hey, Mark, I don't, you might need to help me with that. So... This is just a little video showing you as we purge bearings, um, you can see that developing grease. I don't know the particular size in this, but uh, you can see as we're pumping grease into the bearing, you know, again, the temperature will go up, but you can start to see that grease developing at that area. And when you see that fresh grease developing when it's running, that's when I'm gonna tell you to stop, okay? You wanna see that good, clean, fresh grease and stop. Now, again, the other thing is, as I mentioned, you will see a bearing temperature spike when it's a brand new bearing and also when you're regreasing, you're going to see that temperature spike, and that's okay. That's normal. What you don't want to see is you don't want to see it trending up and just keep going. That's when we got a problem. Thanks, Mark. Oh, there we go. I actually was able to do it. So. Um, so bearing temp, you know, we've talked about this a little bit, but, you know, again, I mentioned about one of the bearing myths about bearings being hot to the touch. All right, the pain threshold is about 130 degrees. That is a perfectly fine operating temperature for bearings. All right. I always, I always joke around that if you think a bearing's hot, there's an easy test you can do. You can spit on it. If your spit sizzles, then that's a problem. But if, if it doesn't, then you're fine. Okay. Most bearings are rated for up to about 225 degrees, um, and that's generally going to be the limiting factor. Is going to be like the grease or maybe the rubber contact seal lips. But you know, 130 degrees, you're going to put your hand on it, and you're not going to be able to hold it there very long. And that's a totally fine operating temperature for bearings. So um, if you do have bearing temperatures where you are taking a temp gun and it's running hot, again, what I would also tell you to check is are both bearings running hot? <clears throat> you know, if you have two bearings running side by side and one's at 180 and the other's at 190, I would say that's fine. It's when you have one at 180 and the other's at 350 or 400. That's when you have a problem going on with that bearing. And obviously, as we mentioned earlier, there's heat sources. There's a lot of things that are going to affect you know, bearing temperatures, but you generally should have them running uh, pretty close to one another as far as temperatures go. 
again, having the right seal for the bearing is, is very critical. I remember when I first started with the company, I had a gentleman that told me, you know, if you gotta remember one thing, it's seals sell bearings, okay? Seals are gonna sell a bearing in the sense that a better seal obviously keeps contamination out. But having more lips on a seal is not necessarily always better. If you have a triple lip rubbing contact seal here on fan applications, that's gonna cause heat. That's not gonna be the seal you probably want for fan applications or hammer mills. You know, you wanna go to like a metal labyrinth seal, some sort of clearance seal, that doesn't have that drag from that, uh, from that contact lip. You know, also uh, triple lip seals, they're pretty common. Um, you know, end covers. Um, you know, end covers are something I think is great, especially Brian being the safety guy there. <clears throat> you know, this is something that I think is great for facilities. You know, there's, there's requirements about how much, you know, a, a rotating shaft needs to be covered. I can't remember if it's like seven or nine feet or whatever the number is off the ground. You know, generally you don't have to necessarily cover that, but I think it's always a best practice to cover rotating ends, especially on catwalks. If it's right at waist level and you're walking, um, it's easy to get uh, caught up and tangled up in something in a rotating shaft. So, you know, end covers are great, pretty inexpensive. Um, you know, and then the best seal of them all is what we call a cast closed housing. And that's really only offered in one Dodge bearing. But if, you know, if you can put a cast closed housing in, that's the way to go. You don't have a seal at all. <clears throat> You know, we talked about the sealing system, and I also mentioned earlier about grease and how grease uh, affects it. Oops, let me go back here. So that grease dam, you know, again, by pumping grease and purging that excess grease, you're going to have, whoops, I keep doing that. You're going to have fresh grease built up at all those seal lip areas to help act as an additional seal, okay? Now, uh, lastly, I mentioned about end covers. You know, there's a lot of different uh, end cover options out there, but for a small, small premium, you know, that, that can be a nice feature to add to your bearings from a safety standpoint, and also from a contamination standpoint. That's just an another auxiliary seal right there for you. So um, as we wrap up and, and talking about uh, lubrication especially, over 80% of bearing failures are lubrication related. All right, that's why it's so critical to make sure we're maintaining our bearings properly with the right grease, the right amount of grease, um, you know, 20% is wrong lubricant, 20% probably aged lubricant. You have solid contamination. Uh, and then obviously 15% is not enough lubrication. And then uh, liquid contamination too. Water is, I mean, in my opinion, water is the number one killer of bearings. If you can keep moisture out of bearings, um, they're gonna run a lot longer. Water, water will take bearings out. <clears throat> a few pointers on uh, bearing storage. Um, you know, Mounted bearings, a lot of times you just let them sit on the shelf and you don't think about them until they fail. And then you go get the critical spares off your shelf and you put them in, okay? Bearings generally are gonna have about a three to five year shelf life. And it's ideal with your mounted bearings to make sure, um, especially on your critical spares, you know, if you got big fan bearings or hammer mill bearings that cost thousands of dollars, you know, what I would definitely recommend is number one, trying to keep them in the manufacturer's packaging when possible. Okay, I know a lot of times you like to pull them out and sit them on the shelf so you can see what you have. That just opens them up to a lot of dust and, and uh, environmental conditions that can dry out those seals. But what I would also tell you is go ahead and put a bead of grease around that seal lip area and keep that rubber seal nice and soft. That's gonna prolong your bearing life. And this is something too um, that oftentimes gets overlooked but I think is very important. Get in there, and I'm not talking all your one inch pillow block bearings, but you know, again, your critical bearings, get in there and just rotate them by hand 10 to 20 times every six months or so, all right? I have a customer, you know, calling a lot of different industries and I have a, uh, I call on a lot of rock quarries. And uh, this one quarry that I call on, they had a critical spare crusher motor, 500 horsepower motor, sitting there in their outdoor Quonset, just, you know, as a critical spare. You know, we're in Iowa, you got hot and cold cycles. 15 years that motor sat there. And by the way, like many of your facilities, well, pretty much like all your facilities, there was a railroad track close by as well, okay? Railroad trains would come, send some vibrations through the ground. Nobody ever even bothered to go rotate the shaft on that motor. And guess what? The motor failed one night. So they go get this critical spare that they've had on hand for 15 years, and they put it in, and 12 hours later, that motor failed. The reason it failed is because those bearings, just by sitting there and the vibrations from passing rail cars, develop flat spots. So 500 horsepower critical spare motor that lasted 12 hours because they never got in there and rotated it by hand and never did anything with the maintenance of it, okay? So obviously you can see where I'm going. It's very important to make sure your equipment's well maintained. All right, I'm at my time here, so um, just wanna finish up in summary. You know, ball bearings, we talked about at the very beginning, high speed and light loads. 
tapered bearings are going to be your heavily loaded bearings, generally slower speeds. They are your screw conveyor bearing. You want tapered bearings for screw conveyors. Spherical bearings, again, high loads, medium speeds, and you really don't want to put those in screws. That's going to be the bearing that's not going to give you the life you want. You know, check the shafts for tolerance and properly torque the set screws. Again, not all the time, a realized real world, but when you do have those problem child bearings, get in there and check them. Be cautious when using anti-seize with adapter mount bearings. And then also, you know, when we talk about lubrication, generally speaking, most roller and ball bearing manufacturers use a lithium complex grease. NLGI number two, your tube should say lithium and NLGI number two somewhere on it. That's good. I don't care what brand it is, but it should have those two things. And then, you know, relubricate, safety first, relubricate when running. And then, I can't say it enough, purge that grease. You know, see that fresh grease developing at that sealer, and you know you got the bad stuff out, and the good stuff is replacing it. All right? And then, as I just mentioned, maintain those critical spares. Okay? Um, that's all I have. I, I appreciate everybody's time today. Um, you know, I have some cards, too. If it's something that you ever needed, uh, I'm based out of the Des Moines, Iowa area. Um, you know, Dodge is a company. We have about 95 of me across the country. So depending on where your facility is at, if you ever need local maintenance and installation-based training, maybe some hands-on stuff, um, you know, I can by all means get you in touch with a, a Dodge representative in your area as well um, if it's something that you'd like to do on a local level. Okay? Any questions for me?